thank you, God, that we could be alive and be a part of your present purposes in the earth. You're really causing the heavens and the earth to become consummated. I thank you, Lord, that we are beginning to see the reality of the heavenly man become manifest. I thank you, Lord, would that comes a responsibility to carry you with absolute sincerity to begin to show forth who the Christ man is in the earth. You believe in the church. You continue to give her the energy and the sustenance to launch forward. I thank you, God, for this place that you have raised with the gifts that are within to bring impact, not just to this local, local place, but Lord, to have a real thrust into the world. And what I pray this morning that as we listen, give us the ears to hear you. I pray, oh God, that we won't be like the people when you declared, hearing they hear, but they don't really hear. And seeing they see, but they don't really see. I pray our hearts become fertile right now to have incredible reception to that which you say to us, that we in turn will reciprocate this. And so God, I thank you, God, for the instruction. I thank you for the reproof. I thank you, God, for the correction. I thank you for the divine alignment and the reconfiguration. I thank you, God, for the reforming, the refreshing, the re reconciling, the restoration. I thank you, God, for the, this, the, the, the whole man that's being formed right now. You are the head, and we are the body. We know that, Lord, that you sought for a place that your head can rest, and a piece of the body is right here, right now. So we don't take it lightly. We love you and give you praise. I thank you for the divine activities that are taking place right now. I thank you for the angels ascending and descending upon the sons of men. I thank you, God, for the keys of breakthrough. I bless you. I glorify you. Come on, let's just lift up our hands and praise him for a, a few seconds here. You're good. You are good. Hallelujah. We lift up these antennas and we engage you. Thank you, Lord. We praise you. Amen. Has God been good to you? Amen. Has God been good to you? Has God been kind to you? Has God been gracious to you? Has God been loving to you? Amen. He's worth every ounce of energy we have in our breath. Amen. Yeah. Well, uh, this morning, I want to just maybe pick up a little from where we were at the men's conference. Um, we, we talked about man, and we're really starting to see God really give us the real definition of manhood. Now, when I say manhood, some of you women are getting a little concerned because you're probably asking, what about womanhood? Well, you're going to have to take this up with God but there's no such thing as womanhood because a woman and man are one in the Lord. You understand? The differentiation of a woman and a man comes after sin. Prior to sin, there was no separation and no segregation. So when we go back to look at what manhood is, we have to see manhood in the context of Christ. That we have become bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh. Anything contrary is antichrist. The body, the church, which is called the bride, has to take a position, and men have to understand that they too have to be called the bride. So, any kind of chauvinism and any kind of differentiation and segregation. They will oppose 
the mind of God behind his divine purpose is contrary so we have to come back into the core reality of understanding who we are in God and who he is in us so that we can have proper functionality in our lives in our environments that have been given to us and wherever we go we carry Christ representing him with his nature with his character with his personality so that the world can see who Christ is amen so in the book of Ephesians chapter 2 verses 10 I'm going to take my reading from there this morning Ephesians chapter 2 verses 10 I think we have to read Ephesians reread Ephesians and continue to read Ephesians till the pages get torn and then you can eat the pages if you want to and let it be like Ezekiel honey to your mouth okay but in chapter 2 verses 10 Paul says for we are his workmanship okay everyone say workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works say good works which God has prepared that we should walk in them so I'm gonna read it again for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God has prepared beforehand that we should walk in them so theoretically many believers when we look at this verse we believe that we are God's workmanship but in practice we at times don't really show that we are God's workmanship because when God comes to really put his hands to our lives to begin to shape us the pain that we go through when he's shaping us we sometimes tend to deny it because we want to disacknowledge that God is crafting us he's engaging us he's forming us he's shaping us to become the image and the likeness of him why is this why do we deny his workmanship when it comes to the level of where he shapes us we live as though the responsibility of our development in life and our perfection is based upon ourselves if you look at yourself in a mirror you will see yourself some of us are balding some of us are fat short and stumpy others are tall thin and skinny we all have different shapes of noses and teeth everything about us is different so if you look at yourself in a mirror and if you decide to define your workmanship based on you and if you are an emotional roller coaster you will define God the way you define you and if you define God the way you define you you represent God in the same manner to your friends because your life is in leakage so you represent Christ in leakage and so when people look at us at the church we're not just extraordinary beings we are supernatural beings we're not trying to aspire to the content that the world provides but we set the trend for the world to follow what supernatural beings do in being God's workmanship we have to make a deliberate choice to bend our hearts to heal and submit to the purposes of God it's a choice that you have to make pastor Patrick and his team will never be able to convince you of something that you are stubborn about and if stubbornness is a sin of witchcraft then you caught up in yourself you will you will either fall by the rock or the rock will fall on you you choose this day what you would want from God in Romans chapter 6 verses 13 he says 
Do not present your members as instruments of unrighteousness to sin, but present yourselves to God as being alive from the dead. That your members as instruments of righteousness to God. In order for us to know that we are God's workmanship, we have to go back to His plan of creation. Genesis chapter 1 is the vein that we have to look at because it really sets the standard of where we were, how we lived, and how we ought to live there on out. So when you look at Genesis 1, you begin to see the son called Adam and how he would function. So we've been taught many things about Adam, that he sinned, he did all his crazy things, and so today we pay a price for what he did. If we believe that God created a perfect man in the garden, and out of this man came a woman called Eve, and she was a little dangerous because she misled him, and after that, you know, problems occurred. But if you look at it, out of this man comes this woman, and together this man and woman will become uh, progenitors of the race of God in the earth. A perfect race. And then here comes Satan, and that snake, whether he was a viper, whether he was a black mamba, I don't really care. I'm honest. He's not my problem. He's never been my problem. He's never been your problem. You understand? We got to get this right. So then we, we believe now that this all took place. So Satan comes and then he's got more power than God. He's standing there and then he says, hey, sexy Eve, come here. <laughs> now, whether he had fangs and he was hissing, I don't understand. I don't know how to interpret hissing. And I pray you don't hiss when you communicate. Okay? No hissing, no translation, no interpretation, right? You'll get delivered if you hiss. So this serpent comes and he says, do you want to be like God? And so she in her fragile mind said, hey, that's a good thought. I never thought about that before. So I'll partake of this fruit. And then Adam, he gets away because a lot of times we always accuse Eve of partaking of the fruit first, but the scripture says she gave it to him, meaning that he was somewhere nearby her because she gave it to him. And so then God's plan is now messed up for the world because the devil had more power, misled his children, so God's plan is now scrapped and he has to go into play to do something else so that he can get back into course so we can live as a perfect race in the earth. That's an absurd thought. Absolutely absurd. The devil was made by God. He was made to serve the purposes of God. So God's purpose never got stopped based on what happened. He was the initiate of what happened. Now you're going to get mad. It's okay, you can get mad. He had to initiate what happened because there's a divine purpose of God in the earth. He knew that there was going to be a son that will be slain before the foundations of the world. And in a time-space world, that son will manifest in the fullness of time. And when he manifested in the fullness of time, he would die to redeem mankind, to lead us back to the basis of the image and the likeness of the Father. I am his workmanship. Come on, say it. I am his workmanship. <laughs> Satan did not disarrange God's plan. He was God's plan. You quit giving him glory. Everything you go through, your trials, your circumstances, the devil did, the devil did. He's going to do something to you if you keep inviting him in. I am his workmanship means that in those trials and in those problems, in the sufferings, he's molding us. Workmanship did not stop. It's a continuous progressive movement till the Christ man becomes formed in us.
The devil has no authority and no jurisdiction. He didn't take Christ's life. Christ gave his life. For a moment, he might have got happy, thought that he was getting promoted by God. But on that day, when you look and you'll see, you'll say, is this this little thing that did all of this to me? Because we allowed that little thing to become a monster because we talked about him so much based on what we're going through. The rain falls on the just and the unjust, but the just should know who their savior is and what they can do in and through him. In Genesis chapter two, verses one, after the heavens were made and everything within it was constructed, God looked, first of all, and he said it was good. Everyone say good. good. Say, I'm good looking. I'm good. Come on, say, I'm good looking. I'm, good. I'm his workmanship. I'm so he looks and he says it's good. And when he got completed, he said, everything that was made and all of the host in it was finished. Completed. Done. And he rested, and then he brought a man that will now tend to what God would say to him to tend, to have dominion, to rule, to subdue. I'm going to throw something out that's not, not in my notes. I, I hope you don't stone me, but listen. You probably look at me weird, right? It's fine. I am weird. Crazy accent, weird, it's okay. How can you have dominion in a garden that you couldn't have, that has put perfect? I would think when one has dominion, you have to have dominion because there's something that has gone into effect that contradicts what was. How can you rule over something that's perfect when they're already functioning with no issues. So how would Adam know what dominion is and how would he know what rulership is and how would he know what subduing is when he doesn't even know what to subdue and have dominion over? So you're God's plans in play. I'm going to teach you rule. I'm going to teach you dominion. I'm going to teach you how to subdue. And the plan goes right into play. And so today, when we look at the chaos in the world, when we look at a falling economy, when we look at perverseness, when we look at the church so confused about who she is and what she should be doing, they're still talking about issues pertaining to debates, whether he is three and whether he's one, whether he's two. We're arguing about all these things being bamboozled because the bigger picture of dominion is far bigger than the schisms that go on between us. And so we lack in takeover and solutions. And then the world tries to bring up all these solutions and these solutions are disappearing it cannot help the president, governors, congressmen, they confused. Totally confu confused. When the answer of dominion, when the answer of rulership lies in the hearts of the sons of God. I mean, this is the number one problem that we face in our lives is that we still have to be convinced that the Father is our Father. Why do we have to be convinced that the Father is our Father? When I, when I gave my life to the Lord, my, my father and my mom were divorced. I'm the youngest of four children. And my father was a, a Maharaj in Hinduism. That's his background. The Maharajas are the Levites 
in Hinduism. The highest order of priesthood is the mirages. And so my father did his man duty once or twice a year to take me out to buy me some clothes, <laughs> which was instructed to him by the courts. And so when I experienced the Lord at the age of 14, I knew God was the real deal. There's nothing, nobody could have done what happened in my body, in my experience with God. I had a Jeremiah experience, so nothing could take that away from me. So when my father heard that I was going to church, he gave me an ultimatum. He said, you choose between Hinduism and Christianity. If you choose Hinduism, you'll walk in all the rewards of what I have and you'll, you'll be privileged. Meaning that I'll have the money, I'll get a share from his will, whatever that was. I'll get all the benefits of my natural father. And I listened to him share and I made a decision. I'm going Godward all the way. I'm going God with all the way. And my father ostracized me. I probably hadn't didn't talk to him for about 10 years because there was no platform because I was in Christianity and he was in Hinduism. And I was going to serve God as stubborn as I could be because I know my Jesus. He's my dad. Now, that's not to say that you dishonor your father in the natural. You understand? Whatever you do in the natural is a representation of your spiritual transactions. And so, I chose God because I know who He is to me and I did not need to be convinced that He's my Father. He is the Father of my spirit. He's the Father of my life. I was in God before the foundations of the world was made. Our workmanship in God started before He spoke Adam into existence. You are not a lonely, lost soul. Devoid, crazy, I mean, some of you might be. We were in God has spirit. In a time-space world, when God said it's time for you to manifest, you manifested through the parents that you came through. Let's get things straight. I was born an illegitimate child. If you were born an illegitimate child, it doesn't give you a reason to be a victim. Get over it now. If you understand God's forgiveness, then no one has to convince you that what happened can be forgiven. See, a lot of the church, we don't want to hear this because we have to pacify people. Okay, brother, it's so, so sorry. It's, it's okay. Listen, bad things happen. Don't get me wrong. I, I'm, I'm married to a wife and, you know, we, I, I love my wife. We married for 12 years this year. I have four children. And I, I, I look at them. Uh, when I, we do devotions and when I sit down, I, I think about their lives and I think how great it is that like, I could understand what it means to be a father to them. Now, a lot of people don't have that. But when you see the grace of God come and the mercy of God come and that you His workmanship because He believed in you before the foundations of the world, it's just that you were robbed of your understanding. When you know God, He starts to fill that up and He fills and He fills and He fills and then you look and you say, God! Wow! You just wowed me! You don't need a psychologist, you don't need a psychiatrist, you wowed me! This is the Father. This is the God that we serve. Eden was the starting point of what will become a progressive movement there on out. That this Eden lifestyle was an environment given. 
In our world today, we have two words, heredity and environment. In heredity, you have inherent characteristics by the parents that you have in your life. The hair, the nose, the looks. You know how we, when we see a baby born, I, this always gets me. Whenever, it's ladies especially, when ladies see babies born, they say, oh, he looks just like his mother. And I'm looking at this little puppy like a bulldog, <laughs> skin all laid, and you're like, I'm seeing the eyes all cockeyed, no elasticity, flip-flopping around. He looks just like his mother. You can tell that soon. I ain't when the baby's ugly, you're just trying to be nice. I'm just being open. All right, it's just honesty. I know you can hide it and you can look, but I mean, the baby is, it just came out, it's got, it's swollen. My, my first son was born, I thought God did a number on me. I mean, <laughs> no one told me about babies and like, I mean, I don't, I don't want to watch a woman giving birth in the classes. Like, I got sick looking. I was like, I got, I got to get out. I walked out of that birthing classes like, I just had enough. Okay? But I mean, my son Jaden, the oldest boy, came out. I looked at his head. He looked like a cone. I thought God gave me an alien. I mean, and my wife is saying, I said, Selena, I, I don't want to offend my wife because it's also part of her genes. I'm trying to find a nice way to say, honey, this child's head is oblong. <laughs> and eventually I tried and I tried. I said, I said, what happened to this child? And she says, she says love. In vaginal births, that's what happens with their heads. It's all gonna even out. I sat in the chair, I lifted my hands, I said, Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> now I knew he was good. I mean, man, I just, it, it was tough, you know, but listen, Eden was a starting point. And in heredity, you have the characteristics of your parent. An environment sustains where you are. Eden was an environment that would have progressed to expand the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God was not some building with lights on the street and golden places that you can run and jump on. The kingdom of God is a family of God. And out of this family will come sons that are in the image and the likeness of their father, Christ. The finished one was Jesus. There are two men, Adam and Adam. One was a life, breathing, giving, soul. Some translations, that word soul is the word being. The last man, Adam, was a life-giving spirit. You're looking for scriptures? 1 Corinthians 15. Read the whole chapter. Okay? So Christ will come into play to take us back to understanding the representation of who we are in God. When you study the, the tabernacle of Moses, you have the outer court, you have the inner court, you have the most holy place. When you look what the outer court consisted of, it was the brazen laver and the brazen altar. When you look at what the inner court consisted of, it was the golden altar of incense and the golden candlesticks, the seven spirits of God. And it had one more item on there, which was the table of showbread. 
when you go into the most holy place, there was a Ark of the Covenant, a box made up of wood. Now this wood in the box, we will, we will call it, it was the mercy seat. It was where the glory of God was. So, in the old, man was wanting to go to God. Only certain men can go to God. When Christ comes, the picture of the tabernacle is Christ. If you took the tabernacle and you lifted the tabernacle up, you'll see Jesus. The brazen laver was his feet. The altar was his belly. The table of showbread and the golden candlesticks were his hands. The golden incense of the golden altar of incense was his heart. And the mercy seat, the place of glory, was his head. You'll see it as a cross below. When you lift it up, you see it as a cross out. You understand? So we move to the context of now understanding that man is no more body, soul, and spirit, but he is spirit, soul, and body. So Christ would come to take us back to the principle of first things for us to understand who we are. When you looked in the tabernacle, a lot of the places were constructed from the bronze, okay? Specifically, there was a lot of things that were specific in the tabernacle. In the most holy place, when you looked on the ground, it'll mirror what it sees. When you gravitate and you become transformed into the spirit man, you lose focus of you because now all you see is your father. Mufasa in the Lion King, was that Mufasa? Was it? Rafiki was the prophet, right? He told that king, he said, look at the Simba, look in the water. And he's looking, yeah, he's having all these grasshoppers and all these critters, and then he looks in the water, he realizes, my goodness, I could be having some venison. I could be taking a big animal down and having meat. See, that's how we are. So Christ comes and he finishes the work. He becomes the patent man of God of finished creation. He is the representation of the Father in the earth, in fullness. He is the standard after whom we are redeemed and to be fashioned, formed, and transformed. Christ is the manifested being, Son of God, Son of Man. God has not made this complex for us. It's easy. So when you understand that you are the Son of Man, the Son of God, there's another element in understanding that you are His workmanship. And let's maybe stop at that last point since I don't want you to get upset. Jesus is recognized as a baby. He's recognized at the age of 12, asking the Pharisees questions. The questions that he was posing to the Pharisees and the scribes in his day about who he was, these are all high-level people. He was asking them questions about himself. Why? They knew the law and the Torah. So he was asking them questions because he was the Messiah. If you want questions answered about your life, go to the book. The book is not just Jesus. It is us in Christ, the hope of glory. Don't get super religious and start singing, it's all about you, Lord, it's all about you. It's all about you in Him. 
Because if you keep singing, it's all about you. The world doesn't know him, but it knows you. At the age of 30, he's at the, the Jordan and his cousin John is going to baptize him. Well, first of all, John says, oh, I don't want to baptize you. I can't do this. You're the Messiah. All that good stuff, right? It's Matthew 3. So he, he goes and he gets baptized and Jesus says that all things might be fulfilled, right? All, all righteousness might be fulfilled. Immediately, the heavens open up and a voice says that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. The Spirit comes upon him and what does the Spirit do? It takes him into the wilderness. Any time that you will encounter God, you will go into wilderness. If you're looking for a nice basket of fruit, you'll find it behind the rocks, somewhere in the deep, deep, deep wilderness. Jesus did not perform any miracle. He didn't heal no sick person. He did nothing. And the Father is saying, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. The Father bestowing His love for you is not based on a miracle, on a healing, how much money you give, what church you established, how many souls you saved. It is based on Him being pleased in you because you were in Him before the foundations of the world. He thrust him into the wilderness and for 40 days and 40 nights he'll go through temptation. Jesus was not exempt from going through what you and I go through every day. Hebrews will say that he came in the likeness of his brethren and he suffered in every aspect that you can imagine. He was tempted in all things and he overcame. Son of man, son of God. Adam was created out of the dust. Christ is born of a woman. You were born of a woman. This baby will have to learn and cry, poop in his diaper, if they had diapers, pee, all that stuff, gas. Sorry, worldwide audience. <laughs> America is different. They do all kinds of different things here. This man, Christ, represented us. And when he goes into the wilderness, it is where what the Father said, I am well pleased with you, goes right into full effect. The Father bestows he is pleased with you. You are his workmanship created for good works. But when the Lamborghini is made, it has to go for a test run. You being created in God will now have to go through your test run so the formation of God can take place in your life and you can say just like Jesus, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. I won't bow down and, and worship you. Now, how does it equate to modern language? Absolutely it does. Look at our lives. Look at everything around us. Every day we can make a solid stand to realize that an honor that God is well pleased with me and I am His workmanship progressing toward the expansion of Eden in my life representing the Son of God, out of me come sons of God, and the family becomes built and constructed upon the principles of the Father. But when the Father is engaging and you look into the floor, 
you see the mirror image of the glory. And every time you begin to see the glory, the glory is the impetus, it is the, it's the driving force, it's the fuel that allows you to lead a life governed by God in the earth. Just as in the natural, there's an environment to sustain us with food, with water, with beverage, there's an environment in the Spirit called Holy Spirit that sustains us with what He has made us with. So it's time to elevate to the next position. It's time to grow up. It's time to represent Christ. The world will not know who Christ is till we exhibit Christ. He's the pattern. Okay? When we start to function in this capacity, the world must look like they said to Jesus, what manner of man is this? Stand up. What manner of man is this? What manner, what manner of man is this? Now, I'm going to say something. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Reject profane and old wives' fables and exercise your life to godliness. Exercise your life to godliness. Being his workmanship means that every day we exercise godlikeness. We go beyond the natural and we engage with God. Jesus didn't have to roll on the ground. He didn't have to cut himself. He knew who he was as a son. You are a son. Again, separation came when Adam said, this woman that you gave me, There was no time prior to that when he said, this woman that you gave me. Only sin allowed him to say, this woman you gave me. The first son out of Adam was Eve. Always in him. When we exercise godliness, whatever he is confronted must manifest into his likeness and image. There must be evidence that we can see, that we can say that we have been created in his image must be evidence good works God has never been created that which is spirit must take on its form take on the form of God all earth groans and travails for the manifestation of the sons of God saying take on your form take on your form spirit man take on your form Hallelujah. This is a day to be alive. A day to transcend the worldly philosophies and principles and the mundane things that offer us nothing. May offer me clothes and gasoline and all that stuff, but he has manner. <laughs> I have food that you don't know about as yet. If there's a famine, I'm not scared because I have food that you don't know about yet. We'll provide the world with this food. Come to our kingdom. The Lord said, ask for rain in the time of latter rain and he will give us rain. I believe that Shiloh is in the time of asking the Lord for rain. I felt that there's been a sifting in this place since the last time I was here. And God has been realigning things in this house. The foundation has been set and now the building blocks are continuing to be built. I see rooms being built. I see facilities being built. I see expansion going on in the midst of this place. I feel the Lord is calling you as he did Nehemiah and he said to Nehemiah go back and build me these walls now you must understand that Nehemiah couldn't produce all the new bricks so he had to take existing stone that were burnt and construct the building everybody else laughed at Nehemiah but he took the burnt stones so the Lord is saying today to 
Pastor Patrick and the team, I'm giving you the burnt stones for that which people laughed at and that which they rejected, that which they had no idea that I could use. I'm giving you these burnt stones and they'll become the formation of this building. These are not stones made up of mortar and brick. These are stones that are lively. That will bring out the creative, innovative lifestyle and the ways of the Father. That out of this place will come inventions. That out of this place will come creation. Creational things that will impact mankind. You're going to start to see such an, a whirlwind of rapid change take place. For that which you worked hard to convince people about and talk about. They are going to have quick, rapid change. Like almost like a gun going off and you can just shoot and the bullets don't stop coming out. God is governing this place and in His governance, He's allowing a power to be developed within you that you can carry the love and the grace of God with a tremendous compassion to see the lives of His people become transformed. Leadership will arise out of this house. Leaders will travel out of this place. What I've given unto you is not meant to be contained. It's meant to be spread like rapid fire. A portal will be in this house constantly. A portal that will allow people to have their minds changed. A portal that will be in this house to help people have miracles and healings and get their bodies correct. Growth and maturity will take place in this house. This place is called to be a center of divine transactions, divine interactions. You have the keys to your city. Shiloh has the keys to the city. Why? Because you knew how to unify the servants of the Lord. You knew how to bring them together and not speak bad on them. God has entrusted the city into the hands of these men. Young people, you better get ready in this place because you're going to be known all around the world. You're going to be known as one of the most radical beings in, in America. You're going to start to see lives transformed by the power of God in you because of the weight of glory in you. You're taking to this message of the kingdom. You are understanding it and you're going to grow in it and you are going to become models that people will look and see and they'll say, wow, there's the pattern of God in this place. Government will come. They're going to give in to the things of God for this city and for this state. God is in your midst. I see helpers coming from different parts of the country to come to assist. Skilled craftsmen, skilled workers will come. They came to help build the temple of Solomon and serve Solomon. God's allowing these skilled men and women to come to help in the developing of this work because God has His hand upon you guys. I'm going to step it up right now. I want to tell you that out of this house will come governors and will come congressmen, will come mayors. They'll be in this house right here. What man has failed to listen to out there, God will raise up in the midst of you. And you will go and you represent God in the city. It's all in this house. What a time. A time of rejuvenation, a time of strength, a time of where the Spirit of the Father is arising. The sound of the Father is arising. The mind of the Father is being understood. The Spirit of the Father is your to totally take you. Jump, jump, jump. I, re I release those out of depression right now. 
I break off depression of you. I cast you into the dry places. In the name of the Lord, loose these people. The sons of God can no longer be bound by depression, anxieties, weaknesses, infirmities. Loose, loose this grip right now. In the name of the Lord, yes, yes, loose it. I speak the life and the fortitude of God into your spirit, man. Resurrection power, resurrection minds, resurrection spirit. Sweep through this place right now in the name of the Lord. Cancer, you have no authority. Cancer, you have no authority. Say it. Cancer, you have no authority. Cancer, you have no authority. Go out of here in the name of the Lord. Let that portal now come. Spread it all around these people as a tornado. Whirlwind come. Some of the four spirits of the earth, Lord, to come. Birth this thing in this house, I pray right now in your name. You come as the Father in this house and you bring your measuring stick to test their growth. I thank you, Lord, that you are measuring them. And these lively stones are saying, bring it on. Place us. We'll go through process. We'll go through workmanship in order to apprehend Christ in our lives. I cast out drugs. I cast out drugs. You understand, I know there's a few of you. Drugs can't help you. But Jesus can. Your high will fade away. But I want you to know, once you go in the wilderness, it's all good. <laughs> what else can they take from a dead man in the wilderness? If he died, you died with him. When he rose, you rose with him. You already dead. What are you worried about? You're gone. You died. Self-will is dead. Christ will is alive. Your purpose is dead. God's purpose is alive. Your mind is gone. Christ's mind is in you. Resurrection power and resurrection life. In the name of the Lord. Yes. Hallelujah. Lord, we say yes to your purposes. We say yes to the divine, incredible mandate of you. And I ask right now, Lord, that that holy fire will be poured out upon us. That you have awoken in us a place of understanding that we are your workmanship. That we are consistently growing every single day in you. Progressing to this place called finish. There has to be a finishing generation in the earth. There has to be a generation that lifts up its eyes and says, Come, Lord Jesus, come. Come on, say it. Come, Lord Jesus, come. We will be so jealous and envious if we never walked in this place called finish. We don't want to die in the natural right now and let this go. We choose the life of the Spirit to give us the assurance as we become formed that we too can say to you, the work that you have given unto us, we have completed. We have completed. And we hand what you have done in us back to you. And we say it is finished. This is it. This is it. That the world may know him. The resurrection of his power. His life. And that he laid it down. No one could take it away from him. He gave it. And we understand it. 
I bless you with the blessings of the Father. I pray the Lord will cause His face to shine upon you. I pray that from today onwards, you'll quit complaining about you and start loving God. I pray today that you would not lose hope in what you go through, but you look at your circumstance from sickness to disease, to these trials and circumstances of finances, business, and you say, you know what? Bring it. Bring it, I'm going. I'll go down, God, you take me. Go down so you can come back up. You don't lose, you win. And so we go back to when he said in Genesis chapter two, the works and the host of everything in the heavens has been finished. I love you all. God bless you.